Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm an ecologist by training. And when I graduated in uh, 81, I really couldn't find a job because people didn't know what to do with an ecologist. <laughs> and um, it's only in 85 that I started working in FAO after many little jobs, I must say. And uh, one of my first tasks was to prepare for the Rio conference in 1992. And we had a two years uh, process of negotiation with governments to develop what became chapter 14 of Agenda 21, Sustainable Agriculture and Rural Development. That was, let's say, my first contribution to sustainability. And as you can all see, sustainability became a hollow word over the years and everything became sustainable. And this approach, which started sustainable agriculture and rural development was meaningless because there were no means to put it in practice. It was a lot of nice talks, you have a long list, but it wasn't really practical. And uh, along the years I've been involved in sustainability issues uh, in a way that you know led me into the kind of work I'm doing. But still today when we talk about sustainability, people have different understandings of sustainability. So um, I made this little uh, short video on the need of integration of different sustainability dimensions, which actually I'm launching tomorrow in FAO to member countries, which I will show you. Everything always begins with the natures of earth, air, fire and water that start by struggling against one another and then combine. Their relentless quest for balance manifests itself in the world through dryness, wetness, heat and cold. Until something shifts amidst all these possible, impossible and symbolic inorganic combinations, something moves and life appears. I perceive this movement of life my farming soul recognises the volatility of the air and the solidity of the earth and observes the opposing powers of water and fire clashing in the open air laboratory where I sow, till and reap. I accurately quantify the weight and value of my products and calculate the chemical and electrical energy that I buy from suppliers and the power of my workforce. But my costing ultimately does not consider what nature gives me free of charge to enable me to produce. Nor the price paid by the whole planet in order to continue to create and sustain its life-giving flows. To ensure the continuity of my work, I wish to assess the sustainability of my economic, environmental, social and management actions and identify best practices that will improve my actions. But look, as the connecting structure continues to approach, I realise that the men and women that I can see moving down there are getting ready and seem to be making arrangements. One of them, Water, turns his face to me and attracts my attention by waving his hand. Does he want to question me? Intrigued, I switch my gaze to him and get prepared to listen. I'm making myself visible to you with the aim of making ecological conversion socially desirable, fostering global agreements between people and inducing the planet to dance. My pillar is political and measures accountability, the rule of law, participation, holistic and ethical management of your enterprise undertakings in the world. The choice to support environmental integrity is not a choice. If the ecologists are wrong, we lose nothing. If the others, those who want to carry on consuming without limits, are wrong, we lose the world. Nothing against everything leaves no choice. The second law of thermodynamics and I are certain that a finite ecosystem cannot sustain economic growth infinitely without collapsing sooner or later. 
I will give you the tools to fine-tune your investments and your resilience within your local economy, for you to produce quality while respecting the social contract. I am here to tell you that self-assessment of energy consumption and ethical commitments is not an accounting method, but a process of learning, a creative action. It not only gives numerical results, but places you and your business in a context based on the right of all. The terrestrial biosphere, of which you, your family, your employees, your land, your factory and your nation are only a part. We are ready to ask you questions and draw your results on a circular diagram. I am the social heir and I blow. I uplift and from above the world does not look as it did before, made up of things, but instead it is made up of colours and words. A rating that falls in the red circle indicates an unacceptable result. Reaching yellow is a moderate performance. Pay green is good. But the best performance is the dark green. Participation, page 90. Definition of the theme. Participation in SAFA refers to the need for outreach to and ensuring the potential for involvement of interested parties, in particular... Fire has turned into economy. The wisdom of water has changed to governance. Earth has become environment. And the relativity of social has replaced volatile air. Arranged as spokes around the green circle appear the 21 themes that compose the Sustainability Assessment of Food and Agriculture System, or SAFA, the natural contract with the world, which I am ready to accept by going through a process of self-assessment. Put it on dark green. Definition of the theme. Animal welfare is the physical and psychological well-being of animals. We come as guests to the Earth, but increasingly we assume the role of hosts, deciding who has a place on Earth and what the Earth is going to be like. Let's be aware of our situation, let's invite others to begin to join us, and let social processes and children realise their potential. Let's learn together Become a SAFA partner! Okay, so this is mainly to talk about the different dimensions of sustainability and I'm going now to present to you Safa. Up. Okay. Uh, what's the business case for sustainability? Because when you talk about sustainability it has to be practical. People have to really feel that there is an advantage when you are applying sustainability. And increasingly in the last few years, I must say, there is a conviction among many private sector companies also that sustainability, you can make money out of it. It's not necessarily environment or conservation, uh, conservation or development. They are not at odds. There are more and more companies like uh, Nestle, Walmart, and others that do have sustainability schemes. I mean, we can talk about them later if you want, but what they're understanding increasingly is that the natural capital has a value, and if this, uh, this natural capital is collapsing, there is a business cost. And typically in 2008, for example, many companies realized you know, what it means you know, when you have less resources. It became tangible. Um, a company like Puma, for example, did the first environmental profit and loss account to see what is nature giving them to their businesses, mainly for textile, for example, to make shoes and so forth, and uh, leather from cows and so forth. And they did evaluate the gifts from nature to 145 million US per year, you know, in terms of business. So when the moment you have a shock in nature, you do have extra costs. 
So the sustainability is more and more becoming uh, not anymore only an ideal of people uh, like me when I was studying perhaps, but you know, really something that people can work with uh, for business. Uh, it's increasingly being integrated in cost-benefit analysis. What am I gaining and what I am losing in looking at more sustainability issues? Um, many supply chains are looking at hotspots, you know, and try to address these hotspots by looking at their sustainability and managing, you know, their operations. And of course, at the market level, when you have any kind of sustainability label, you have more customers buying that product. However, we talk a lot about sustainability and when we did, we started doing SAFI, I will tell you five years ago, but when we did the benchmarking against sustainability schemes, we realized that there is a widening gap between the talk, what people say, and what's happening. You look at all resources in nature, social, economic, what have you, we have more and more crises. I mean, we all know this. So we talk more about sustainability, but we have less sustainability. So when you look at different labels claiming sustainability, there are many of them. These are only a few just to show you about, you know, the range of different labels that you can find. And it could be, for example, Mars has a small percentage of cocoa, which is uh, Rainforest Alliance or something, and they say it's a sustainable enterprise. Uh, sometimes it's uh, CO2 uh, friendly, you know, uh, or less CO2 or water or bird friendly. It really varies and then there is a claim for sustainability, but there is no universal understanding of what that means in reality. So when I try to take some labels and um, put them in a framework, I could see that most of the um, sustainability claims are really at the production level, much less at processing and marketing level, because here you have down there actually, the um, production chain, you know, from input that you know you need for your enterprise, production, processing, uh, manufacturing, packaging, distribution, marketing, and so forth. So you have this dimension, which is the value chain dimension. There's another dimension, which I didn't draw here because it would become too complex, which is like this, which is the environmental, social, and economic. And you will see that many of those schemes have more environmental or more fair trade, you know, social or others, but they don't really integrate everything. And then these tools for sustainability are really made for different purposes. And here it's the purpose that interests me. And the first row here are the kind of sustainability, uh, sustainability schemes that are looking at performance. And you have RICE, which is, has been developed by University of Bern that Nestle used a lot, looking at the farm level sustainability. Um, there is COSA, there is uh, now SMART, which has been done by FIBEL on the basis of SAFA, and sustainability uh, and life cycle analysis um, approaches. So these are looking at performance. Then you have the standards that we all know, like the organic standard or the forest stewardship standards and so forth, which are more product oriented, and they end up by putting a label for them on the market. And then you have other tools which are really used for benchmarking. Um, SSTI is one of them. You know, they benchmark standards, you know, how much uh, they fulfill certain requirements or others. Then you have directories, and one of the biggest directory is the ITC standards map that now we have. Um, and then you have um, requirements for reporting, like the GRI reporting. And then also you have policies. So you do have a variety of different uses of any sustainability tool, be it for a market, being for benchmarking, for policy making, and so forth. So it's important to see that there are different ways of using um, a sustainability tool. And all those different u possible use are really captured in the SAFA framework. And I, I insist on saying it's a framework, you know, where you could have all these different applications. So the objective of SAFA, when you look at the private initiatives for sustainability, the ITC standard map had already documented 130 different initiatives. And the idea is to have a framework which has all these best practices in one. So you don't need to go to different schemes. 
Um, and then an, another, another aspect is that instead of being focused on one dimension of sustainability, environmental or only social, or <coughs> excuse me, or one stage of the value chain like only production or manufacturing or so forth, the idea of SAFA is really to look at all these different dimensions at a different stage of the value chain. And when we did SAFA also, we wanted it to be applicable to the food and agriculture sector. So we had specific experts looking at the forestry aspect, the fisheries, because in FAO, uh, at least food and agriculture is forestry and fisheries also, um, processing, uh, marketing, and so forth. So it's really inclusive, and we wanted to make sure that it applies to smallholders and large multinationals, regardless of their size. So the principles is to have this holistic approach where you have all the different dimensions in one go. Uh, we wanted to have also an international reference. It's a bit like the Codex Alimentarius guidelines, if any of you is, a, is aware of these. These are guidelines. These are, let's say, um, a common denominator on which governments can have their own uh, tools after that. So the idea of SAFA is to have this common reference at universal, at universal level. And also we wanted it to be inclusive and to have all types of stakeholders. And um, contrary to what people think, it's not a labeling tool, it's not a standard. These are guidelines. They don't say do's and don't. And I think this is a very important distinction. So how did SAFA develop? It was in 2009, actually. I was at um, Nuremberg. There was a Biofach, and uh, there was a conference on sustainability for two days, and different enterprises and companies came and presented their sustainability schemes. And the, um, uh, the organizers of Biofach, their idea was to have a fair for organic, for not for organic product, which was the occasion, but for sustainable products. And then they realized that there are no uh, metrics or no understanding of what sustainability is. It re-diverged. Everybody was sustainable somehow, but there was no way to compare all this. And together with ICEL, Sasha Courville, who was heading ICEL then, which is the Alliance for uh, the Environmental and Social Sustainability Schemes, uh, we thought that maybe we could do something about it. And we joined hand between FAO and ICEL to start working on SAFA. And it wasn't a creation of our own. We did not want to do things and add another tool to the many tools available. We mapped what is existing and took what is the best of all to put them in this framework. For example, if I had to do a checklist, it could have been even better than what we have today, but it's not realistic. So it was important to use those tools which are already practiced and which are practical and take the best of what's happening and put it in the framework of SAFA. And then we had a series of um, expert meetings, surveys with, um, with different uh, stakeholders. Uh, we had two rounds of um, e-forum where people did contribute their comments. And this is how the first test version of SAFA guidelines was released in 2012 on the occasion of the Rio Plus 20 conference. And after that, we had different pilot studies to try to see how it was working in the field. And we were doing the pilot studies with Excel sheets then, you know, for the SAFA. We did not have the software yet. And then we had another expert meeting where all the practitioners were brought to FAO around the table together. And the stakeholders who are all those uh, who work with sustainability tools from private sector and academia and NGOs and so forth. Everybody, practitioners and partners were together to talk about ex their experience and to see how the tool could be developed. So it was quite an extensive process of participation. And um, the development was purposely slow. It took all in all five years. And this was mainly because we did not want to create a system which was another one. We wanted to use what's existing, and we wanted to see what, how we could serve the world better without um, duplicating what's existing. And as we were developing it, you know, we were taking different direction depending on the demand. So it's very much demand-driven, I must say. 
Uh, so the guidelines for, uh, for SAFA were released last December, the finalized uh, guidelines, and now we are in the implementation phase where we had the beta tool which has been piloted this year that now we have finalized and we are doing some other products that I will illustrate to you. So in terms of participatory development, just to give you an idea, in terms of public comments, we had 410 people who registered to the e-conferences that we had in 2011 and 2012. Uh, we had the participation of different multi-stakeholder organizations. Um, for example, if you take the SAI platform, they have 40 members. The Sustainability <coughs> Consortium has 48 members. So these are, they count like one, but there are many of the uh, companies included in that. And then we have other also private sector companies that are working directly with us. Um, for the moment, I am talking a lot with Global Gap, you know, because they're looking for a set of best practices to use for uh, um, the Global Gap uh, guidelines of the future and different retailers like Metro and Migros. And then, of course, we had civil society organizations um, like FlowCert for Fair Trade, for example, the Forest Stewardship Council, IFOAM, um, Textile Exchange, and, and etc. Um, surprisingly, one of the main users of SAFA are academia. <laughs> Uh, this, it wasn't developed for academia, but many universities are using SAFA, and uh, this is the proof today, actually. And many students have been doing their uh, master or PhD on certain application of SAFA, and even before it was um, released in 2012, there were two master um, uh, students who did their thesis on the SAFA, the way it was, at least before the, its release in 2012. And then Feeble, for example, which is the Swiss Institute for Organic Farming, developed SMART on the basis of SAFA. And it's a way to, uh, uh, to look at the uh, different indicators for sustainability labeling that they're doing. They have about 500 indicators in SMART. Uh, Argos is um, another company which is funded by the New Zealand government. And their idea was to have a sustainability dashboard, they call it, to prove that the export from New Zealand are sustainable uh, by nature. So that was an interest by the government in New Zealand to develop that. And also SIAM, which is the um, Mediterranean Institute for Agricultural Research, which is based in Bari for their Mediterranean Basin uh, countries, they are using also SAFA for capacity building purposes. So we have been mapping different international uh, normative references like uh, the ILO conventions for, for labor, for example. We looked at the OECD indicators for um, um, in, environmental indicators and many different references have been benchmarked and uh, mapped in that process. Uh, we have piloted SAFA in uh, different countries and did the beta testing also. So we covered all the different continents and all the different settings from food, non-food, forestry, fisheries, even uh, wild production by Maori uh, was done, you know. We did also some comparisons of uh, cotton production in the US, uh, GM cotton and organic cotton, and looked at the uh, result that came in the, uh, uh, during the pilot phase. It was mainly to do with sensitivity analysis on how much the tool was going to capture sustainability. And it gave us a lot of lessons. So this is how we have now these um, main products for the moment. The SAFA guidelines, which is the framework, you know, how you go about it. And it's very much um, looking at the objective. At the end of the day, I want to have a good performance. It's not making decisions on whether your practice or my practice is better, as long as the result is good. And this is this objective-oriented framework, which is also multi-use and adaptable and flexible, which is really the, the heart of the guidelines. And then on, at the request of the partners, when we had the meeting in 2013 in March, we did develop the SAFA indicator volume, which is quite a, a big volume. In the beginning, we just had uh, an indication of the indicators. And it was for you to go and look for 
the indicator information. But we did have a request from the users to develop that information. My experience with indicators is that whatever you do is never good enough. <laughs> you know, uh, So this is the best of our knowledge today, but it's in a separate volume because I think it will need to be updated as we go on a continuous basis. And then we have the Safa tool, which was released in beta version in December and now piloted, which we have now revised and we will release it actually tomorrow because tomorrow we have the launch of um, some new products we have. So when you look at the Safa framework, you have environmental integrity, and it's important to look at land, water, biodiversity, but also at material use and energy. Uh, at uh, animal welfare, we put it there, it doesn't really pertain to environment only, but we didn't really have a dimension where we could put animal welfare. We had a lot of discussions on that. I think that in the future, sustainability will maybe ha need to have a fifth dimension, which is ethics. You know, that goes beyond what we are doing now, which is much more utilitarian, you know. But for the moment, we have um, animal welfare there. And then we have social well being, uh, and we have the usual issues of labor rights and food safety, but we also have other uh, things like fair trading practices um, and cultural diversity. Then economic resilience is the third pillar, and this one has received a lot of discussion while we were developing it, because the idea of some people was to have economic development, which is the normal way of going about the economy. And we discussed a lot, and it was much more reasonable to go for economic resilience. And if you look at events like in Japan or others, you could be in a very good economic shape, but if you are not resilient, your system is going to collapse. So the resilience came about as much more important than development and wealth per se. And then the fourth dimension, which is good governance. And this one was a bit politically hot to add. But then in um, Rio in 1992 already, when you look at the sustainability indicators we developed already 20 years before, we had environmental, economic, social, and institutional. I mean, if those who want to go and check, we had an institutional pillar. And this institutional pillar was forgotten a little bit. But unless we have the right institutions, the right management, whatever we do on any type of development, economic, social, or environmental, is not going to be sustainable because the heart of the matter is really how we manage our system. Then we had, of course, discussions. I mean, is good governance more important than the others? And people have different views, you know. Some people would like to have environment as being the most important pillars. Others social. I mean, it's really, it, it depends on the objective. So at the end, the choice was to have them all at the same level. As you can see, there is no Yerchi as such in Safa. We have the four dimensions, and they're all at the same level. So when you look at each of the pillars, we have always the themes, and this is the simple, let's say, cut. And under each team, you have sub-teams. Those sub-teams were chosen in function of a value chain. Hmm? Now, if I look at the sub-teams of uh, maybe not this one, but uh, some, something else, you know, maybe we'd have different sub-teams too as a component of the team. But this was really crafted for value chains. The idea is that at the team level, you always have a goal. For example, atmosphere. You don't want to create greenhouse gases. You don't want to pollute. You know, this is your objective. And then at the sub-team level, you have more disaggregation of what the atmosphere includes. It includes, in this case, greenhouse gases and air quality. It's not only greenhouse gases, but there is also air quality. And those have objectives also, which is a bit like the um, the TBT objectives, you know? We don't need to do that. Now, how we get there is after something else, because there are different ways of achieving a performance. And to measure those sub-teams, we have indicators. I was a bit reluctant to define indicators, but it was really requested by all of our stakeholders, at least, you know, to help. And those who have their own indicators, they can still add their indicators. So um, we have indicators, which are the elements that you need to measure, the metrics, to achieve that objective of the sub-team. So the environmental uh, approach in this is 
goes a bit beyond LCA. You know, we are used to have LCA life cycle analysis for atmosphere and maybe also for water, but LCAs don't usually capture biodiversity land use issues. For example, if you look at the uh, greenhouse gases which is emitted by uh, by livestock and you do it by kilogram, you know, and certain system like the intensive system would appear much better because they would produce less greenhouse gases by kilogram. But then if you do, if you go beyond the LCA and look at the rational use of land, huh, and you will see that it's much more rational to use lands like grasslands to convert, to convert the grass into, into food energy than use grain, you know, even if you are going to use greenhouse gases you have totally a different scenario that comes out, you know, because it's not only the LCA by kilogram, it's the whole use of the environment. And this is what we are trying to capture here. The performance of a practice is going to be reflected on more than one theme. You do something, but it will, is going to have impact on the land and water and social and some other things. It's not only on one aspect. Here we have the economic pillar, where you have investment that looks at internal investment of an enterprise, you know, how much you're investing to improve in the future, how much you are contributing to your community, and the long-term investment you're making, on top of the usual indicator, which is profitability. In terms of vulnerability, we look at the stability of supply of the market, uh, of liquidity availability, and different issues. The product quality and information uh, normally have food quality and safety. And we have also product information, which is traceability, labeling, and so forth, which is additional information that you are likely to have in sustainability schemes. And then we have the local economy. And there is increasingly this attention to uh, local procurement, local economy, local employment, and so forth. The social pillar has, uh, as I said, you know, the um, labor right and equity and uh, human safety. And one novelty of it is to be have the fair trading practices. Because we've seen that many sustainability schemes, and sometimes it can be even an uh, um, organic scheme, for example, where you think it's very, very sustainable, but you have more of the profit, for example, going to the buyers and less to the producers. So we have paid special attention here to the right of suppliers, the responsibility of buyers. So all these relations at the micro level are important and the whole social pillar is based on rights at all levels. Governance is perhaps the dimension which is obvious but known to, to, to most people, not known enough to most people. People always wonder, you know, what are we going to put under that? Of course we have rule of law, you know, what law allows you to do, what's legitimate the whole resource appropriation where you have the land grab would come there. Um, remedy, restoration and prevention and civic responsibility. And then you have, of course, uh, the uh, participation of different stakeholders, accountability. And uh, accountability, I think it is, no, okay, yes. Uh, holistic management, yes. Holistic management has a sustainability management plan, which means you have to look at the sustainability of your operations in all dimensions of sustainability. And it has also full cost accounting. And full cost accounting is something where among stakeholders there was, um, I would say, a common agreement that we didn't know much about that and we should really join hands and do full cost accounting. How do you account for the environmental and social cost of an activity? And this is another project that I have been following. We can talk about it some other time. But it's uh, an emerging science, I must say, and not much is, is known about that. So really this sustainability pair goes beyond the corporate social reporting, the CSR, that you find in many uh, sustainability schemes and it's looking at other issues. So who can use SAFA? I mean it can be really different kinds of users. It can be governments, it can be investors and policymakers. 
what you know best is the use of SAFA by producers and company because the tool has been crafted for these type of users, but also by NGOs for development projects, researchers, and the sustainability community. So how can it be used? If I go to the mid-level, you know, we, this is the more the producers and the companies, they can do self-assessments. And the self-assessment allows you to identify your hotspots. And your hotspots, it means that, you know, there is an area where you need to improve. It allows also improvement once you have identified this hotspot. For suppliers, um, if you take uh, Metro, for example, they have for the moment 17 different schemes for sustainability, you know, for food safety, for labor rights, and it's too complex. And their idea is to have one scheme where they can, they can it's simple for them instead of having many, and they can benchmark, benchmark their suppliers if they want to have sustainable procurement for their uh, operations. Uh, in the case of governments, SAFA can be used for strategy development and policy making because you have to set your goal, for, but you know how difficult it is normally to have a goal set, you know, like how much greenhouse gases are we going to allow in the country? And then you have to have the measures to reach that goal. So for the moment, SAFA allows as a framework to design a sustainability strategy but does not have the sub-teams and the indicators developed for that purpose as yet. It's just a framework. And for projects, the project is actually what I'm going to start next year, you know, as um, in this environmental and social safeguards unit that we're going to, um, to establish an FAO. It's really when you have a development project, you can look at different alternatives of how you want to make your interventions and see which one is more sustainable. And again, SAFA can be used, but you, have to, you need to develop your specific indicators to make that kind of work. But the framework in terms of all the teams and how to go about it is still valid for that. So there is different um, ways of using SAFA because it's a framework which is adaptable to different needs. So how does it work? It has four steps when you're doing an assessment. The first one is mapping. Mapping is perhaps one of the most um, most sensitive thing to do when you are doing um, an assessment because when we did our pilot it was interesting we had for example intensive pig production which was extremely polluting in northern Canada and they appeared very sustainable you know <laughs> because the boundaries they did not put them in your management you know you take out you know part of what you need to assess or your input that you're purchasing and which is using a lot of energy so where you're putting your boundary is going to make a big difference on the results you're going to to have and this is why now in SAFA you have this mapping which is your first um, thing to do I and mean, what is it that you are measuring how far are you going to go in your value chain and we even have a map where you have to design you know what is it that you are assessing the second level is a contextualization. Because one of the most difficult things to do when we do such tools at universal level is that they are so generic that they're really meaningless the way they are. They need to be contextualized because each setting is particular with its uh, characteristics. So this one allows you to, for example, to say, OK, I have a landless operation. Um, I, I don't have issues for that, and I can exclude it. Or I don't have animals on my farm, so I'm not going to go through the animal welfare. This one contextualizes better your assessment before you start. You make it more appropriate to your situation. At the third level, you have your indicators. And the indicators is where you have a question you have to answer. You can use existing information or go and do your own analysis to get this information. You can have numbers, you can have qualitative information, different type of information can be entered in the tool to make the assessment. And at the end, once you have um, collected the information and rated your own performance, you have the reporting and you view the results. So this is one of the um, screens of, uh, of the SAFA tool. This is the previous version, 2.1.5. Um, it's on ecosystem connectivity, but what it's showing is that you have a question and you have to answer that question. And you put the information and you decide on what color it is, whether it's best or moderate or limited or so forth in terms of assessment. What we have tried to define from our part is 
the red and the green only. The red is it, what is a no-go? You know, what is the minimum that you should not go below? And it's not only what's not allowed by law, it's a bit more. But you know, it's quite, I would say it's quite generous to be inclusive of all agriculture. It's not a very high standard for certain things. I mean, it's, I think we can discuss the, the benchmarking the, uh, the, the threshold later, but it's one of the most difficult things to do, you know. Where do you put your bar, you know? And depending on the enterprises, you may put it, in fact, there is a field where, um, for example, you can explain why you haven't put it there even though it would go under the red in that particular context. So there's always a way to explain it. And we have the, the dark green, which is the best performance. And anything is in between is for people themselves to rate their own um, performance. So the indicators sheets that we have developed have extra information to help users to go and look for that information and describe what the indicator is about, if it's relevant to what type of enterprise, uh, also fisheries or only production or whatever. Um, it's, uh, the unit of measurement is defined how to measure it, at least you know what we know about how to measure that indicator. The limitations also, because there's always limitations for anything you do. And all the sources of information are given the most important one, I must say, because I think that nowadays our problem is that you have too much information and you don't know which one is best. So we try to put all the tools that exist for measuring um, different indicators in, in the um, and the guidelines here. So we have, of course, the rating. We suggest the rating also. So this is the, um, the polygon. Once you have done your uh, assessment, uh, you can uh, rate you know, your performance. And it's very important to say performance, because it doesn't matter whether you're using practice A or B, as long as the performance is uh, of a certain quality. This is how you rate yourself. But the data may be of low quality, you know, like proxies, and it could be actual surveys, a very good quality, uh, or peer-reviewed journals. I mean, so we have three different levels of accuracy score for your data. And these are the little squares you see, one, two, three. So you know that you know this is the best that we have this round, but next round we're going to improve our data sources, for example. Uh, so I think the origin of the data for your performance is very important. Then when you look at it, the important thing is to identify hotspots easily. And here we see that our hotspot is on investment, and we know that there is a problem with investment, but this is aggregated at the team level. You can disaggregate it at the indicator level, because instead of having only one uh, color, for your team, this gives you the sub-teams and the indicators, and it allows you to go and identify exactly where is it that you have a problem. But actually, when you have your polygon, what do you do with it? I mean, you can decide to act on it. You can also decide that maybe my um, expertise doesn't allow me to improve on that one. I need to team up with somebody else to improve that performance. So it's also something which is conducive to having more partnerships. This is the overlaying of three different uh, SAFA polygons. And the idea is that you, know, you need to have a SAFA for production, processing, and marketing. So along the value chain, you can see you know, your performance by having the possibility to overlay up to three. More than three would be more too complicated. And you can uh, draw better your results about your performance. This is the new version, which we're going to release tomorrow, of the tool 2.2.4 where um, after the um, piloting, uh, we have now also a Mac version, not only for Windows. And we also have one new feature, which is you can add your own customized indicators. Like if you have indicators that you usually work with, the tool now gives you the possibility to put your own indicators, and then they are computed together with the other indicators to rate your performance. And of course, the accuracy score, which before did not appear on the screen, now they do appear on the screen. So the SAFA tool that maybe some of you have been using have, uh, in terms of default indicator, 116 default indicators. And we noticed even though it was in a beta use, it was too complex still. 
I mean, even though we try to make it simple, it's still complex. Um, still, a lot of in companies they need to go to people like you, an expert, or at least you know people from universities to help them go through an assessment. It was too complex, and this is why now we're doing a Safa small app. It's an application that will go on a smartphone and on tablets. And this one, instead of having 116 indicators, has 45 indicators. So we have really looked at the most important questions for smallholders. It's specifically designed for smallholders. The questions are very simple. And the rating is three colors. It's green, yellow, and red only. So it's yes, no, and something in between. And, and you have your uh, polygon at the end. But the beauty of it is that because we are testing it, I'm working together with the Grameen Foundation on this, and it's being tested now in Colombia and in Kenya with about 400 farmers. We have three types of farmers, subsistence farmers on a food security project, and we have also semi-commercial farmers and commercial farmers. So three types and also in warehouses and in production. So we have selected different ones and we have been trying the tool on them and we realized that for a, farming, for a farmer staying for one hour and 45 minutes responding to question was already too much. It was a disincentive. And now we have our questionnaire that can be done in less than an hour. So the idea is that the farmers are more willing you know, to respond to questions because it's simplified and it's very often questions that are giving information to different indicators, I mean, in the system. Um, the, it's, a, it's an application, so uh, an app can be downloaded free of charge. And this app speaks 26 languages already and we can add local languages as we go. And uh, after doing the assessment, there is a possibility to have uh, an SMS campaign, which means you know, sending messages by voicemail or by SMS to on cell phones for people who don't have smartphones. So both the app and the Safa tool, they feed into the Safa database. And the Safa database is being um, it will, we will have the first version of it next month, actually. And it's a way to feed back the information. And by feeding back the information, it allows you to query the, the database and see, for example, your neighbor, how they are doing on water use, for example, or some other information. And at the same time, the database is also connected to other FAO databases, where especially with your app, you can give exactly the point where you are in the world. It gives you all the information. We have an FAO on that spot so you can benchmark yourself. I'm going to go quicker because I see that I'm a bit late. Um, that was an example of a pilot we did in Safa uh, in Ethiopia to show you know, smallholder farmers, you know, why they, they use Safa. They were working on composting and they wanted to see you know, how they could build their capacity and how they were doing on sustainability issues and they used it. So the experiences so far is that the adoption rate by academia is very high, and, and I don't need to explain that to you. With the private sector and the farmers, the adoption rate is medium, basically because it's still too complex and it takes too much time. Uh, the sustainability tool community, which are all the standard owners and other owners, they have a high adoption rate and they are using it in a very creative way to have their own tools. Um, the governments are interested, but we need to develop specific indicators for policymakers, and this will be done next year. So the future of Safa, what you can see is that you know we have the tool which has been revised and will be released tomorrow, which will not be in beta version anymore with the um, function of adding your own indicators. We have the small app also that will be ready next month, and the main purpose of the small of the Sava small app is for capacity building because it's used mainly by extension officers and community workers. And then other other Safa based initiatives, I mean I spoke about the sustainability dashboard. IFOM has done its best practices based on Safa. Uh, there's another tool that uh, has been developed by FAO in Africa for climate adaptation. It's called CHARP. It's done on the basis of, of Safa. 
So future application, of course, the database. The database will be a main source of information. This is, I think, what's the most important part of it, is to provide that information for um, benchmarking. The SAFA safeguard is the work that will start next year for the project with specific indicators. And most probably the SAFA nations will come later, which is what uh, government will be needing for doing their national development strategies. We don't start now, we're waiting for the negotiation on the post-2015 to finish on that. And other applications like now the conversation we're having with Global Gap to have the set of best practices. Okay. I think I was a bit late, sorry for that. <laughs>